Good day and welcome to yet another Funky Daily Devotional. Today's message is titled, A Heart That's Planted in Forgiveness Doesn't Dwell in the Past. And I got inspired by the uh, the, the Asbury song, uh, Sparrows, which I just absolutely love. It just spoke to my heart this morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to service today. Today, I want to speak to you about the importance of forgiveness and how it can help us move forward in our lives. Forgiveness is a powerful force that has the potential to transform our hearts and minds. It can set us free from the pain of the past and help us move towards a brighter future. Today, I want to encourage you to plant your heart in forgiveness and leave the past behind. What did, uh, what did Timon and Pumbaa say? Akuna Matata. Put the past behind you, right? And even I'm struggling holding on to uh, old traumas, old garbage, right? In my bag, just like we were talking about uh, in church with um, Pilgrim's Progress. I'm carrying that baggage around and I need to let it go. So, what does it mean to have a heart planted in forgiveness? Having a heart that's planted in forgiveness means that we made a conscious decision to forgive those who hurt us. It means that we've got to let go of the pain and the anger associated with the past and have opened up ourselves to the possibility of a brighter future. It means that we are no longer held captive by the past and are free to move forward with our lives. What happens when we dwell in the past? Well, when we dwell in the past, we're unable to move forward in our lives. We become stuck in a cycle of pain and hurt, and our hearts become hardened. God doesn't do anything good with a hardened heart. Just do it steady on hardened hearts. It does not look good. And divorce is full of hardened hearts. Same with brokenness. Oh my goodness. Not always, but... We're unable to experience the joy and the peace that life has to offer because we're constantly focused on the pain of the past. That's what I've been dealing with. I've been having a hard time just enjoying the now because I'm focused in the past. Getting focused on the past, getting focused on yourself. And we don't want to get focused on ourselves. We want to focus on others. Jesus, others, yourself. Joy. We become bitter and resentful towards ourse- uh, to others and ourselves. Both. It's a lose-lose situation which prevents us from living a life full of compassion. So why is forgiveness important? Forgiveness is important because it sets us free from the pain of the past. It allows us to let go of the anger and the resentment that's been holding us back, and it gives us the opportunity to move forward with our lives. Forgiveness also helps us to heal from emotional and spiritual wounds, which enables us to experience a greater joy and peace in our lives. How can we cultivate forgiveness in our lives? We can cultivate forgiveness in our lives by making conscious decisions to forgive those who've hurt us. We can choose to let go of the pain and hurt associated with the past and focus on the present moment. We can also practice self-forgiveness by letting go of the mistakes and regrets of our past and focusing on the present moment, being present. So in conclusion, having a heart that's planted in forgiveness is essential For our emotional and spiritual well-being, it allows us to let go of the pain of the past and move forward with our lives. Forgiveness is a powerful force that Jesus brought into this world that has the potential to transform our hearts and minds. Today, I encourage you to plant your heart in forgiveness and leave the past behind. So I'm just going to go through some uh, scriptural uh, verses before we move into our chapteral Bible reading. Um... So one bear, with one, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have grievances against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you, Colossians 3.13. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. And that's Mark 11.25. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins, Matthew 6.14.15. What's one of the things that you know you've forgiven someone? You don't talk about their bad deeds anymore. You've let it go. You're not holding them accountable before everyone else. My goodness. I, I kind of dwell on the past and it's not good. Four, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others, Colossians 3.13. And if your brother or sister sins against you, and this is number five, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you 70 times in a day and seven times comes back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And that's Luke 17, three to four. 
So a great chapter to read for this Bible study on forgiveness is Matthew 18. This chapter discusses the importance of forgiveness and how to handle conflicts and grievances within the church community. It also includes a parable of the unmerciful servant, which illustrates the importance of forgiveness and the consequences of holding grudges. So I'm just going to open up Matthew 18 here. Matthew 18, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed him among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child in my name welcomes me causing to stumble. Verse 6, if anyone causes these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large milestone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. By the way, these little ones, because Jesus talks about adults coming like children, right? So remember, he's talking about those who are new to understanding faith, those who are new to understanding who Jesus is. He's talking this, if you cause any one of those little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for it to have a large milestone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's what he's saying in context of that as well. He's saying both, even little children, but anyone who's coming to God in faith. Verse 7, Woe to the world because the, of the things that caused people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to a person through who they come. If they're coming through that person, woe to that person. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life, eternal life, maimed or crippled, you know, than to have two hands or feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to have eternal life with one eye than to have two eyes thrown into the fire. Hell, honestly, with all the pornography and all the struggles that people go through, all the struggles I go through, you know, how many of us have actually gouged out our eyes? right verse 10 see that you do not despise one of these little ones for i tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of the father in heaven what do you think i am a man uh if a man owns a hundred sheep what do you think <laughs> and one of them wanders away will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off and if he finds it truly i tell you he is happier about the one sheep than the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Dealing with sin in the church. 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you. Don't go blabbing about it to everyone. Go talk to them. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen to you, take two others along so that every matter may be established in the testimony of two or three witnesses. You can bring their friends along and come and talk to you, right? And deal with those hard matters, right? So first you talk to that person one-on-one -on -one about it. Second, you bring their friends in involved. And then third, you know, if they're part of a church, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, right? The council of the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. How do you treat pagans or tax collectors, by the way? It's a good question. People think awfully, but that's not how you treat pagans or tax collectors. You actually call to love your enemy, right? And to give to those who persecute you. It's like putting hot coals on your head. That's how you should be treating the pagan or the tax collector. Just letting you know. 18. Truly I tell you, whoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 19. Again, I truly tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked the Lord, How many times shall I forgive my brother or sisters who sinned against me? Up to seven times? Seven seems like a lot. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who settled accounts with servants. As he began the settlement, a man owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had be sold to repay the debt. 
26. At the servant, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their masters everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back what he owed. This is how my Father in Heaven will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Do you want to go up? You can go up. There's a puppy here. The footnotes here are Matthew 18.11. Some manuscripts include here the words of Luke 19.10. Matthew 18.15, the Greek word for brother or sister, aldeophos, refers here to fellow disciple, whether man or woman, also in verses 21 and 35. Matthew 18.15, some manuscripts, sin... I, sins against you is what it reads. Matthew 18.16, Deuteronomy 19.15. Matthew 18.18, 18, or will have been, and it repeats that again. Matthew 18.22, or 70 times 7. Matthew 18.24, Greek 10,000 talents. A talent is worth about a 20 years as a day laborer's wage. That's how much he owed. 20 years of his life. I'm only 33. That means I would have had 13 years of freedom. I'm working that one off, right? Matthew 18.28, Greek, a hundred denarii. A denarii was usually a daily wage of a day laborer. Let's see 20 verse 2. So let us move into prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts and the power of forgiveness. The power you brought, God, into our lives. Help us to let go of the pain. All that old stuff, God, all that trauma, all that violence that I've seen, all that violence I've experienced all the negative words associated with it, even if they come tomorrow, God, to let go of that pain, all of us, and hurt associated with the past, and to move forward with our lives. Give us the strength to forgive those who've hurt us and practice self-forgiveness. Help us to cultivate a heart that's planted in forgiveness and free us from the bondage of the past. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. So I'm going to read you uh, Praise and Worship um, one second here. I'm going to read you a praise and worship song based on this devotional. It's called Planted in Forgiveness. Lord, you forgave every sin. Your mercy and grace you freely give. You've cleansed me with your precious blood, and I'm free in you, O Lord. My plan is hearted in forgiveness. I won't dwell in the past. Your love has set me free from darkness. I'm alive in you at last. The burden of my guilt you bore at Calvary where you died for all you paid the price i could not pay and my debt is fully paid my heart is planted in forgiveness i won't dwell on the past your love has set me free from darkness i'm alive in you at last you forgive uh you give me strength to love my enemies to forgive as you forgave me and when the memories start to haunt i'll trust in you my loving god my heart is planted in forgiveness i won't dwell in the past your love has set me free from darkness i'm alive in you at last my heart is planted in forgiveness. I'm alive in you at last. Shalom and shalom and have a wonderful day and bye for now.